of the Southern Reading Forum with the wonderful Vikram Talalika, Reproductive Health Specialist, UCHL, and um, mastermind of all things menopause. Today, we are the, the BMS has been busy lately. They've put out a new set of guidelines on heart disease and menopause, and they've also today put out one on unexplained bleeding um, and HRT and what to do with that. So we will start with hearts, and then if we've got enough time, I might because I might throw some of the other unexplained bleeding bits at you. Why not, indeed? Um, and as you can see, we've got the um, the Instagram is going over here. So if you've got questions, I will keep an eye on it. But if you want to watch it in its in its beauty, hop over onto the um, the YouTube channel. I think the Harley Street Emporium one might be the best one at this stage for the way that I've got this poorly set up. Right. So one of the things that we often hear before we actually even get to having having had a heart attack is things like blood pressure. Um, there are a lot of people who are told that they can't start HRT if they've got high blood pressure, it has to be under control. People who are told that if they if they have high blood pressure while they're on HRT that they have to stop um, or that they just basically can't have it at all. So what do we know about blood pressure and HRT? Okay, so let's crack on. So first of all, thank you, Fiona, for uh, having this uh, webinar on the topic uh, because the recent guidelines uh, are about HRT following heart attack, uh, so therefore quite topical. Uh, thank you, everyone who's joined. Uh, and just to say that this follows the wonderful video you did with Professor Angela Mas. That's on the MREF website, and I'm going to kind of pick up some things from there in today's talk as we as we move along. So hypertension, high blood pressure. Uh, when you don't know the exact cause, it's thought to be genes or familial. Then it's essential hypertension or it could be secondary to any other condition, uh, like an immune condition or, or kidney disease or something else. Uh, if you have high blood pressure, of course, it's an independent risk factor for so many things, for heart disease, for kidney damage, for damage to other uh, different organs in the body, for stroke. And for those reasons, you have to have your blood pressure well controlled because that's going to be one of the most important risk factors for all the later life problems with cardiovascular kidney health. If you're thinking of starting HRT for menopausal symptoms, then of course, it's not a contraindication. All that we require is that the high blood pressure be addressed or controlled. Because it's an independent risk factor for stroke or heart disease, one would choose a hormone replacement therapy, which is safest, and that includes any estrogen, usually estradiol, in the form of patch gel spray or implant that's transdermal going through the skin. You want to avoid oral estrogen because there is a small two to four increase risk, fold increase risk of blood clotting. And if you're using progestogen, then you try to stick to the two best ones. One is the natural micronized progesterone, eutrogestan or gapritix, or you have the didrogesterone part of the femistone range. You also have the intrauterine Mirena coil, which is the levonorgestrel, uh, but it's delivered intrauterine, not as oral. So those three will usually mean that you don't additionally increase any risk while you're hypertensive and your hypertension is being addressed. So you can take it while you're hypertensive, but try and achieve good control because you don't want to have additional risk factors for heart disease uh, because they can quickly add up your lifestyle, your high blood pressure, and a few others can add up, and you try to minimize them. Okay. Some people find when they're on um, HRT and they're going through menopause um, and they have high blood pressure that they do have medications for, that the blood pressure starts to start to climb up a little bit anyway. Um, does that mean that you should stop taking your HRT? Should you keep on going? Should you get your, your blood pressure meds adjusted? What's going on? You certainly need uh, addressing the high blood pressure. So as you rightly said, most women will have absolutely stable blood pressure. They will be either managing it with lifestyle or they will have some blood pressure medication, the common ones being ACE inhibitors or amlodipine. And so if the blood pressure is stable, nothing needs to change. If the blood pressure starts spiking up, it could be for many reasons, the lifestyle reasons, as well as stress and many other changes that may be occurring with the hormones simultaneously. All you want to do is do frequent monitoring some women may need 24 hours monitoring. Others will need just certain times of the day over two, three, four, five, six weeks of monitoring. And if you find that it's persistently breaking through the 
the thresholds, the 130, the 85, or 140, 90, depending on your risk. Then, of course, if you're breaking through these thresholds, more often you need to go up your medication or sometimes even add a medication. What you want is solid blood pressure control, but continue to take HRT alongside. Okie dokie. Now, the other risk factor, which often changes around menopause as well, when it comes to heart disease, is cholesterol. A lot of us find that our cholesterol, which used to be beautiful, um, starts to, to the, 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 the nastier one, the LDL, starts to climb up, and the, the good one, the HDL, seems to start to go down a bit. Um, has that got anything to do with HRT at all? Is, and should we all be on statins? Well, actually, HRT has a lot to kind of influence this situation. Um, so, of course, cholesterol on its own will start going up because of aging. So you've got your genetic risk. You've got changes to cholesterol as the system ages, your body ages. But for women, again, lack of estrogen or changes to estrogen, declining, fluctuating estrogen will have solved. So the LDL will go up, the bad cholesterol, the good one HDL will come down. This is even more marked for women who go through premature or early menopause. So the earlier you have menopause, more significant uh, exposure in terms of time and severity to high LDL and low HDL, which is why we often say if you've got POI, premature menopause, early menopause, you've got to consider HRT until you get to the average age of menopause, which is 50, because once you replace estrogen, you can actually see that the LDL cholesterol starts stabilizing, coming down. You can see that there is a change in HDL, even though these women may not have actually started statins. So the diet, the lifestyle, all the good things that you do alongside HRT is key because estrogen will reduce LDL and improve HDL. If you compare that then again to women who are going through natural menopause after 45, again, estrogen, it fascinates me, is a fantastic hormone. It will certainly impact, bring down your LDL, improve HDL. Uh, of course, it varies from person to person how much that happens with estrogen. So some may have minimal effect. Others might see a lot of effect with quite significant drop in LDL and a significant increase in HDL because everyone's sensitivity to the effects of estrogen will vary depending on so many factors in their body. But overall, the message is it will help with your cholesterol control. Again, eliminating one more factor that's likely to eventually increase your risk of heart disease 5, 10, 20 years after 45. Okie dokie. Now, getting to the point where, you know, if somebody unfortunately does have a cardiovascular event of some description, um, of which there are many different types, um, most of them, they say that for women, mostly it's a thrombotic sort of clotting type of, of event or a sort of a rupture of, of a blood vessel. Like. So if we're looking at thrombotic, thrombotic ones, um, and let's say you have it, you have you had a stent put in, or you're on some kind of blood thinners or something like that. Do you have to stop HRT? Traditionally, if I'd answered that question a few years ago, I would have said yes. There is so much happening in the body. You're actively having investigation for your circulatory system. You're under medications, you're under interventions, maybe foreign bodies or different kinds of stents being placed. One would stay away from estrogen while the active phase of treatment is going on because we did not understand how much impact estrogen and different progestogens were having on an active MI heart attack situation. But over the years, as experience has accumulated, we've now got access to better forms of HRT, the transdermal estrogen, the natural progesterone. And as you will often see put down in the recent guidelines from BMS HRT post MI, it does look like we do not need to necessarily stop estrogen if it's being delivered as a patch or a gel or a spray, which means through the skin, avoiding the thrombotic risk. If you're on a mild form of progestogen, not the very strong synthetic original androgenic uh, progestogen, but you are on a natural micronized progesterone or diprogesterone or even the coil, then you don't need to necessarily get rid of the HRT. You can stay on HRT and then continue it after the, the guidelines talk about dose, trying to stay on the least effective dose. That means they think that if you go on a very high dose of progestogen, high dose of estrogen, it may have some thrombotic tendency, some changes to how the, the vessels, the, the, the wall is remodeled after the MI. And so they say, avoid that. Again, we don't have a lot of good data to actually confirm that. 
but they're trying to be sort of cautious here and preventing any use of high dose HRT. But I think in most licensed dose HRT, you can safely continue transdermal estrogen and a natural progesterone or a diprogesterone. Okay, and then those different types of progesterone. If if people are on ones, I mean, this is you know, so these are the non-androgenic ones, I assume. So these are the ones that are. Uh, what's what's the difference? Why should we have those ones in comparison to the ones that would be considered androgenic? What does that actually mean to people? So if you're on an older form or progesterone, androgenic we call them because they have a lot of uh, influence on the male pattern receptors. They are very strong on the progesterogenic receptor, which which is what they should be but they also have action on the androgen receptors, the testosterone type receptors in the body. And overall, when you look at the way progesterogens work, it appears that the stronger they work on the androgen receptor, they tend to be not good for metabolism, not good for diabetes, more thrombotic, and more risk for breast. They are actually better for stopping bleeding or preventing endometrial cancer. But if you look at the balance, there are more downsides to using this high androgenic oral synthetic progesterogen because you're going to have less favorable effects on metabolism, diabetes, breast, thrombosis, and your heart disease risk. While if you choose a milder progesterogen, like the eutrogestan diprogesterone or, a, or a IUS, then you're getting less circulatory synthetic strong progesterogen. And in that way, you're probably having milder influence on your insulin, on your metabolism. You're not having as equal amount of high risk as on the breast. They are not thrombotic. And so that's the advantage of having them if you're thinking of any background medical problems. Yeah. Okay. So let's say if you've had, a, if you've had an event and you're, you've been told that, okay, you have to come off it now, would you, would, what, what would you... How would you convince your, your cardiologist that that, that wasn't necessarily, that's not what the guidelines are saying now. Because I guess the other thing too, the people worry about is they think, okay, well, you know, if estrogen is protective for blood vessels, and yes, okay, I'm now 60-something and I've had a heart attack and and if I'm told to come off it, hey, all of my symptoms are going to come back um, and that's stressful and worrying for people, um, and B, that they would be losing whatever estrogenic benefit that they've had before. So should they be worried that they would be losing, if they if they are told, no, not for you, um, should they be worried that they are losing any estrogenic benefit? Well, I, I would say, they sh first of all, they should be questioning why they should be coming off HRT if they are needing it. So... Somebody who is on HRT is taking it for a good reason. They're simply not on it because they want to be on it. It's a medication and it's been given for an indication, it, probably for symptoms. And of course, they have side benefits for their heart and their bones. So if they've been asked to come off, the first question they would have to say is, why come off? Because now there is enough guidance, there is enough observational data, there's randomized control data that estrogen doesn't harm. In fact, is very good for heart and blood vessel. We now have enough data that modern forms of progesterone are not going to damage the heart. In fact, post-MI, people who get a HRT don't seem to have any significantly increased cardiac risk or events. So there's no danger from continuing on HRT. So the question is, why come off? If the, if the person who is treating the individual is not able to make that decision because they may not be hormone specialists, they could liaise with a menopause specialist, a hormone specialist, or a clinic where they see more patients post-MI on HRT. And certainly for the individual, you can work out that they can stay on HRT. If the decision was then made not to be on HRT, and I can't understand why, but let's say it's made for some other reason that they can't be on HRT, then of course they would have to follow everything else to try and protect their heart. Because yes, they will lose a little bit of protective effect of estrogen there. It is much less after 60, so most of the protective effect is before 60, early in menopause, but it doesn't mean there is no effect after 60. There will still be some estrogen benefits that will continue. But if they can't take HRT or they've been asked to stop for some or other reason, they would have to then rely on lifestyle, statins, other medications to try and reduce their future risk. But again, come back to the question, why do I have to stop it? And try and maybe get a second opinion or see a specialist to see if you can still carry on. That would be my advice. Okay. Now, the interesting thing you mentioned, you know, that the, the estrogenic benefits start to diminish as we get older. Why is that? It's because I think estrogen can't keep with the amount of age-related changes that are happening. So in a way, to put it the other way around, 
if you just kept taking estrogen, can you live to 150? Perhaps not, because there'll be some background changes that will catch up. And the estrogen is trying to prevent the plaques, prevent the atherosclerosis, prevent your blood pressure going up, keeping everything nice and supple. But it will come to a point where your genetics, your age-related change will catch up with you, maybe in 70s, maybe in 80s, maybe in late 60s for some. So at that point in time, little data, but it suggests that the benefits are getting less and less and less because your aging is catching up with you. Estrogen still is doing its job, but it's far too much for it to kind of antagonize. So your other factors than stress, what you're eating, your background, family history, gene-related cholesterol changes, all are going to be relevant more at that point. Mm, absolutely, <laughs> depending on how fast you run. Um, you mentioned statins there. Um, and this is an interesting one too, because, it, and you mentioned blood pressure targets before as well. It seems that these are variable, movable feasts, um, which, you know, if, if they say, you know, an, uh, uh, your cholesterol, your LDL should be around 2.7, um, and in theory, your blood pressure should be closer to 120 on 80, hopefully under 130 on 85. Then why are we sort of now sort of told generally it's like oh one forty on ninety is fine. It doesn't really matter if your LDL is three point one. I mean, surely we have a target or we don't have a target, or am I just being too black and white? Again, targets are usually good for standardizing care, but remember that there will be individual variability, uh, and targets are based on widespread studies on what should be the outcome that we should base our threshold on uh, of introducing a medication or not introducing a medication. Throughout the history of medicine, targets with different disease uh, or conditions have kept changing. Uh, and cardiovascular system, of course, is so variable, so labile that it will keep changing even in future. As we are having this discussion now, there will be newer numbers suggested in the next 10, 20, 30 years. I think what is important is to follow the guideline that's most likely or most relevant for your group of patients. For GPs, for example, NICE guideline will set certain numbers for them, whether it's 140, 90, 135, 85. Those numbers will change slightly as more and more research comes up. For example, as you cited with blood pressure, most research suggests lower the better, hit hard, hit early, get lower blood pressures and you're going to save so many damage to your brain, to your heart, to your kidney. So as the research comes in, the numbers will probably go down further. Uh, cholesterol numbers will again change at what threshold you introduce a statin, you introduce a phenofibrate or some other medication. Every doctor probably should follow the guideline that's most relevant to them, to their population in the setting that they practice. So as a gynecologist, I wouldn't treat somebody's cholesterol I would refer them to the GP and the cardiologist, whoever is appropriate, because I shouldn't be treating their numbers. I should be advising them on estrogen, what side benefits it has for them if they consider it as a treatment for menopause. All right. Going back to the progesterones um, for a second, a question over here. Um, what about those of us who take eutrogestin for, for the HRT component and the mini pill mm -hmm. contraception for bleeding control? Is that too much progesterone then for, for heart or metabolic health? So I don't think so. That should be fine. So progesterone, natural progesterone, eutrogestan is thought to be the best one around. In fact, some of the small studies, observational data and a few hundred or 200 kind of number uh, participant studies show that even natural micronized progesterone has some metabolically and uh, cardiovascular benefits. It's, it's a sort of... Um, mild progestogen, which has neutral effect on heart and cardiovascular system. So in a way, it should be really fine to carry on with your progestin. You're not having any damage from it. In terms of the POP, very little data because it's usually been as contraceptive, not really as mainstay part of HRT. There is very little study in relation to this regard. But one would assume that the dose in the POP is so small, it's in microns. And so it's a so small dose and you're likely to very get little exposure, unlike the oral synthetic Provera or norethisterone, which are high dose as part of a combination HRT and quite androgenic. I think you should be fine. In future, though, once you finished needing the POP, you would just move on to eutrogestan if you did not need it for, say, contraception or you needed better bleed control. It might be worth going up the eutrogestan itself rather than having the two progestogens together. 
So do that as you move along. There's no need to rush or panic in short term. I think you'll still be fine. Okay. And another question over here. If your cholesterol is above six, is HRT still okay? <laughs> Again, it depends on so many factors. I don't know you. I've not seen you, what your lifestyle is, your BMI is, what other risk factors there are, what the genetic risk is, family history. There are so many things. So I think if cholesterol is high, first thing is it's borderline. If I look at just the number, so there are many ways you could address it without needing medication. If you had to take HRT for menopausal symptom, that's completely fine. You can address your cholesterol side by side. HRT will help with managing cholesterol on top. All right, Karen, I'll come back to your question in a minute. Um, right, now, with HRT and hearts and things along those lines, there are also other questions that are sort of like, okay, the window of opportunity. If I've gone beyond the window of opportunity between 10, 10 years after I had my last period, am I putting my heart health at risk? So I'm going to give you my, my independent opinion here and then what the guidelines say. I feel you can certainly start HRT even after 10 years. So even after you've gone through menopause and it's been beyond 10 years and you feel there are symptoms which can be treated with HRT, you've done a trial and it actually works, you can stay on HRT. If you're above 60 and you didn't have HRT before, but you think symptoms have gone on and you would like to treat your symptoms, you can have HRT. Yes, you may not have as many benefits as somebody or if you had started HRT when you were 50, that's because the changes to blood vessel and heart had not happened with the lack of estrogen. Now in the last 10 years, there would have been some changes that would have already happened. So you may not have the benefits of having very clean arteries and, and great uh, a sort of effect on the heart, but it, it will still provide you with estrogen, which will still be good for circulation, for metabolism, and all the indirect effects it will provide you with. It will certainly not suddenly increase your risk of heart attack or any risk, because we know from all the randomized and observational data that it may not benefit, but it has a neutral risk. And so therefore you will not have excess cardiac events or heart attacks or morbidity or deaths because of heart disease. So it's still worth taking it if HRT is a treatment for your symptoms. All right. Now coming to the controversial bit out of the, um, the Angela Mass um, interview, and this is where I guess cardiologists and, and gynecologists or menopause specialists part ways. Um, she was saying that, you know, once you're into your 60s, you should really probably stop your HRT because you're putting your heart disease at risk. And I'm guessing then that she's thinking about um, sort of unstable plaques in arteries that could break off and give you a sort of thrombotic type of effect. Um, but does, does that argument hold any water, especially since actually she was going back and citing the WHI study from 2001 or 2002, whenever it was, um, which as we know was on older forms of HRT, older women who had pre-existing conditions and was generally sort of flawed from the start. So what do we think about heading into your 60s and your 70s? Are we staying on it or are we going off irrespective of whether or not we've had a cardiovascular event? So certainly I wouldn't take the stance that you should come off HRT. And that's not because I prescribe HRT. Um, simply saying the reason to do that is individualize. Very few women not everyone would want to stay on HRT in late 60s, early 70s, or even 80s. There are more individuals starting to do that now. And one of the difficulties we have in advising at that stage is we don't have good data because traditionally HRT was only given until 65, maximum 70, and then almost everyone came off. So we don't have large studies in big numbers in 70s and 80s to say, actually the risks are exactly same. They are more or they are less. Based on the observation, based on the data we have, if you used a safe form of HRT, and when I say safe, it's transdermal estradiol in any form, in a licensed dose, and natural progesterone or didrogesterone in a safe, in a licensed dose. If you use those two, at the moment, based on whatever evidence we have, I think you wouldn't increase your risk of heart disease, morbidity, or mortality as far as we can stretch it. So there's no need for you to compulsorily say, okay, I'm 65, I start reducing and come off in one year. I'm 70, I start reducing and come off. We simply don't have data to support that. Neither do we have enough data to say, what are your exact risks in your 70s and 80s? Because we don't have the actual studies. So individualize, if a woman is still feeling benefits of HRT, then actually she should continue 
because even in that situation, her quality of life, the less bone fractures, the less hip fracture uh, will actually still override any theoretically increased risk that will come to her uh, from continuing HRT because again, if she's using a safe preparation, the chance of excess morbidity or cardiac events is less, it's not significant, it's neutral. Brilliant, all right. Um, is there anything else on hearts that we should um, think about? So in, in, not using that logic just just before it, but before you say yes or no to, to, to that question, using it, if we're getting into our 70s or whatever and we're thinking, okay, I don't want to stop, should we be you know, maintaining perhaps the lowest possible dose for the bones um, and those kinds of things, or to be continue on on the dose that we were on forever? That's a very good question, and I would have forgotten to mention that. So uh, in a way, what we often see is if a woman starts HRT around perimenopause and she's having some menstrual activity, some ovarian activity, let's say 45 to 50 for most women, then you will find that the dose required is not too much. It's a little bit of estrogen. That's because you're topping up over the existing estrogen. By the time 50, 55 happens, the ovaries have exhausted their estrogen production. The testosterone is hitting quite low. This is the time maximum estrogen, good estrogen will be needed for quality of life symptom control. So you tend to go up in the next five years and you kind of stay on that until 60 for most women. After 60, you find that there is a chance that you can actually reduce dose because sometimes women tolerate the lower dose better than the standard high dose. And you get to your 65, 70s, you find you go to even a lower dose. And that's kind of a natural trajectory for most women. There will be exception. There'll be women on one side who will always need lower than standard doses. There'll be women 10% will always need higher than standard dose. And they are outliers because of some genetic reasons. But majority, you'll find the dose will go up immediate post-op. And in the next two decades, you'll be able to come down to a very low maintenance dose which actually give, still gives the protection, the quality of life, but lowest effective is what we aim for. So that should be very safe for any side effects or long-term risk. All right. Now, this is an interesting question over here because you mentioned before, you know, stay on if you still think you're going to have the, the benefits and, and you think that you need it. But this question over here is basically, what would the symptoms be that would suggest that you would need to reduce it? Are there any symptoms that, that you would have that would think that you would need to reduce it? Mm. So a proportion of women, as they continue on the standard dose, let's say they're taking oral one or two milligram or they're taking a 7,500 patch, or they're taking three, four pumps of gel or three spray, often they will start saying, I'm feeling that actually more hormonal now. Occasionally I've missed a dose and I felt better. They will say, I'm feeling quite a bit of breast tenderness. I'm feeling quite headachey. My moods are actually fluctuating more. And then you wonder, is this less of estrogen? They are not absorbing their HRT. Or is this more of estrogen? Because in, in, in both situations, you might get such overlapping symptoms. But in some of these women, it is actually the estrogen that is uh, more than what they require. So often if you drop one stage down, say from 100 to 75 patch, you go from a three pumps of to two pumps of gel, they, you find that actually the control is much better. So they feel that the reducing the hormones is giving them a better balance than the higher uh, hormone dose that they were on previously. That will take time. It doesn't come overnight. So if you've been on HRT for 5, 10, 15 years, you might find at some stage the HRT is not working the same. You're not feeling right on it. Something tells you that there are symptoms which I'm not, I'm, I used, did not used to have this maybe two, three, five years ago. That would be a time to drop a little and see whether you get on better. And for many, that is the case as you get to 65, 70 or about. All right. Angie, I'm just, I'll am just. i ask you a question then remind me about crossover symptoms. Um, Angie is asking, so, okay, well, if I drop down from you, know, if... If I'm on one pump, is that going to give, give me any type of protection at all? Is that enough to give me heart protection? No. So if you're on already very low dose, or one pump is very small dose of estrogen, it's not like four pumps of gel, then you would either stay on one pump. You can, of course, drop it to 0.5 or even completely stop if you don't need HRT for symptomatic benefit. Because remember, at the moment, by guidelines, we don't recommend HRT purely for heart or bone protection. There are other medication and lifestyle which you use for purely for heart and bone, because even if there is a small chance of breast cancer or blood clotting, then of course your benefits won't outweigh the risk. 
So for primary prevention, purely for bone and heart, HRT is not a medication that's recommended now. Yes, if you're taking HRT for menopause, then it's a very good side benefits that it will protect your bones and heart. Uh, and so therefore you have to make that choice. Do I stay on that very tiny dose? Is it actually helping with me, with my symptoms, quality of life? Then stay on it. I wouldn't drop it further. But if it's not helping with symptoms or quality of life, then you might have to review, do you need to take HRT any longer? Or would you rather go for non-HRT uh, prevention uh, steps? It would help if I could read, because she actually asked, is one pump of gel still enough to give bone protection? In menopause, not heart. She she said bone. It would help if I could actually read. Yes. But you can answer both of those there. Um, okay. So you mentioned their symptoms might be changing when you're going along. Now, there are various points at which um, some things like blood pressure can look awfully like menopause symptoms. It can give you hot flushes and, yeah. and other types of days of night sweats and things like that. So how do you know if it's your heart or if it's your menopause symptoms? So you could you could kind of um, take the holistic picture, look when these things started. Did they actually exactly start with the irregularity of periods? Is it actually happening that there are more menopause-like symptoms rather than just the ones that you would expect with high blood pressure? Uh, for example, vaginal dryness will usually go with symptoms, then you know this is more likely menopause. While only suddenly, sudden onset of headaches, palpitations, you're more likely to think maybe this is blood pressure first, let me control that first and then look at it. So if the symptoms are more menopause, one tends to think HRT. If the symptoms are, if you have a recorded high blood pressure and the symptoms are happening, then of course you're going to treat the high blood pressure and then wait to start HRT. Because if you give everything together, then you don't know which one is which. So your clinical assessment comes first. Is this menopause, more symptoms of menopause rather than blood pressure? Or is this purely the high blood pressure I'm seeing and the symptoms are only related to blood pressure? Once you've done that assessment, treat the blood pressure, give uh, the blood pressure chance to settle. And if there are still residual symptoms, then you would start with the HRT as well. That would be a more systematic approach rather than just giving both together. And if you're at the other end of the spectrum, though, if you're sort of in your 50s or 60s and you're already on your HRT and these things start to come back, mm, would you then, think, is it, then, is, am I, should I be upping my estrogen or should I be upping my candesartan? No. So you certainly want the blood pressure stable first before you up your estrogen. So if you're already on HRT, you're getting new onset symptoms which are overlapping. But the key is blood pressure. If your blood pressure is high, you will address that first. And if the symptoms persist despite your high blood pressure, that's when you start changing your HRT. Yeah, because I don't think that people understand there's so much overlap between thyroid conditions and and simple things like blood. I mean, mm -hmm. I had no idea until a few years ago that blood pressure could give you hot sweats and and night and and you know night hot flushes and night sweats. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, I had no idea that they, they, there was so much sort of overlap on those. So it's yeah. um, we need a lot more education on these things. So we, we can understand them. Blood. Speaking of that, then, is there really, so is there anything else on hearts that we should do before I throw a couple of um, questions from today at you? Well, the only thing I would say is your past history is very important, especially if you've had any inflammatory conditions, SLE, others, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or rheumatic type of diseases, conditions. In pregnancy, if you had high blood pressure, watch out more carefully, monitor your blood pressure more so as you get towards perimenopause, menopause. Because if you've had these in the past, then these are the markers that you will probably need more help with metabolism, with uh, reducing the inflammation when it comes to 40s and 50s and 60s in midlife. So people who've got uh, family history, past history of any hypertensive cardiovascular condition, menopausal symptoms probably worth addressing with HRT because you will have that added benefit of estrogen for your heart. Uh, and so therefore that makes a case that individualization is always important. So you can have somebody who doesn't want to take HRT, keeping a fit BMI, keeping very healthy lifestyle, diet, exercise. They don't need to take HRT. Not everyone needs to. But on the other end, you'll have a woman who is having menopausal symptoms and severe menopausal symptoms are itself a sign that you may be more predisposed to heart attacks or heart disease in future. So if you have severe symptoms, you have strong family history of heart disease, previous heart problems in, in your pregnancy, the more the case that you'll probably have HRT and get the benefits of estrogen on top. 
So that's yeah. how you kind of get the two different pictures and you individualize for every woman based on her risk factors. Yeah. And it's interesting, we know we don't talk much about stroke, but of course stroke is also you know, part of cardiovascular disease and a, and a big killer of women as well. Um, yes. Does what applies to the heart apply to the brain yeah. in all this? Yeah. So most of the studies, the, uh, the RCTs, for example, or the prospective studies did show that you would reduce almost 12, 30, 12 to 38% or something of risk reduction over 10 years with stroke and up to 50% risk reduction heart disease over 10 years of estradiol. So that's quite significant numbers there. Of course, these are individual studies, but the overall message is simple. Estrogen is pro-anti-inflammation, it's pro-anti-diabetes, uh, it's pro-anti-heart and cardiovascular disease. So these are the benefits you can have if you choose HRT for menopause, for symptoms, of course, then these are the side benefits of it. For women with POI early menopause, they must have this because if they're not going to have this early on in their 20s, 30s, 40s, they will leave themselves to uh, a big risk of heart disease after 50. Okie dokie. Another good question over here. Any cardiovascular risks with testosterone therapy? How much do we know about women on testosterone and heart health? Uh, not as good as estrogen, progestogen so far, but there have been trials. Uh, there have been not, I would say, not RCTs that one would like to see, uh, but overall there have been number of studies and the dose that we use for testosterone is so little. It's almost five milligrams a day or less than that. And it gives you serum levels almost close to the physiological range, uh, up to up maybe two nanomoles per deciliter or something like that. So because you're giving such a low dose almost to the upper physiological range, so far, any of the transdermal testosterones we use do not seem to increase cardiovascular risk. So on that account, so far, it's reassuring. Of course, we need better studies with more preparations in future, but so far, so good. Okay. Karen, I did ask you, I think you would, I think it froze. You said it had frozen on you before, um, but I did ask that question, but I will just quickly ask it again, just to make sure that I don't say the wrong thing to you. If you're on a, if you have a stent, you can stay on your HRT. Is what you said before, wasn't it? Yes. So if you've had intervention already, MI has been treated. There's no reason you should completely come off it or stop it. Uh, see a specialist clinic who deals with menopause and hormones following heart attacks or cardiac events. They'll be able to give you a sort of any transdermal low dose estradiol preparation and maybe micronized progesterone, mm -hmm. just enough to keep your quality of life and and other benefits. That way, that should be fine, but but see a specialist clinic. Yeah. There seems to be a sort of a geographical divide here in many ways, isn't there? Sort of English-speaking countries seem to be taking a slightly more uh, open, I guess, approach to to HRT, whereas Europe and other places seem to be thinking, no, we, we you know, we're still, you've got to come off. This is, this is just the way it is. I think it will change, Fiona. In a way, the menopause revolution, more thought, more research, more analysis uh, has started in the UK, in the US, uh, sort of the Northern uh, America. Um, and, and that will spread across the world. Um, we, it's not about saying everyone should be on HRT or everyone should be panicking about menopause, that they have to take hormones. No, not at all. It should be a very balanced message. If you have problems, there are options. Some options have added benefits for heart and bone, others don't, but you can also have lifestyle and so many other options you can have to manage your menopause well. So in, in later life, you have better quality of life and better bones and heart. I think that message will come across. What we don't want is the polarization. So right now, for example, there are very anti-HRT camps and there are very extremely pro-HRT camps with exaggeration of benefits and both don't help. It's really down to the individual woman. What we are not good at is giving that woman that quality of uh, the, the literature, the information. So if you go to one clinic, you get one advice. You go to another clinic, you get other advice. That's what we are bad at. So if we can get a system where a woman can look up to information, gets non-judgmental, neutral information about what she can or cannot do, hormonal, non-hormonal, and that's down to her to make a choice. We should be in that position in the next five or 10 years. That would be the dream. How far we'll get there, I don't know. Yeah. If you've been told that you have to come off your HRT, um, 
and after a period of time you think hang on a second actually i'd really quite like to go on back go back on it is there any time frame if you've had a had a heart condition where they sort of look at you and go well no i'm sorry you you can't go no. back on again as long as you stick to the modern hrt safer hormones transdermal route uh, and the lowest effective dose that would give you the symptom quality of life i don't think that's the particular number of years you have to be on or off hrt to really consider it um, it would be individualized but you can certainly access hrt and restart yeah uh, question here from Ruth. What do you do when you can't have HRT due to cancer? And I'm assuming, Ruth, you're asking here about your heart health, but I think, yeah, I think you've really covered that quite. The, the lifestyle stuff is so important, isn't yes. it? Stress, making sure you're exercising, your diet's good. Um, sleep. Sleep. Yes. Sleep is very important. That's one of the things that affects heart very closely. Uh, I myself am sometimes guilty of not paying enough attention to sleep. So good quality sleep, try everything you can to improve that. Make sure you get at least seven, eight or more hours of sleep, undisturbed good quality sleep. Diet, we know Mediterranean diet is the only one that really has most of the evidence, but anything fruits, veg, cereal, legumes. Then I exercise 150 minutes, moderate exercise regularly without breaks. Uh, yoga, Pilates, mindfulness, anything that lets you enjoy your hobby and takes the stress away on a regular basis, all these will be key. But of course, statins and other medications may need to come in. If genetically you're predisposed to high cholesterol, triglycerides, then lifestyle alone won't be enough. And if you can't take HRT because of risk of cancer, then of course you can consider all the non-HRT uh, medications for primary prevention of heart disease. And for night sweats and, and hot flushes now as well, we've got some good alternatives with that now, haven't we? Yes, that's the, the, the Veoza. So you've got the uh, NK3 receptor antagonist, early days, very new drug, mainly for hot flushes, and hopefully will then improve night sweat and sleep. Uh, but we've just about started prescribing it now. There's lots to learn about it. So in the next six months or a year, hopefully it will be on the NHS, but also we'll have much more information about benefits risk profile. Yeah. Bleeding. Let's just touch on that one a little bit because you set up clinical tools out today for doctors, um, 47 pages worth. What's new in them? What do, what's the take home message? If you've got sort of extended bleeding or unexplained bleeding, is there anything new or different in them that, that people should be aware of? Well, first of all, uh, thanks, and, and it's a great thing that the BMS has done. Uh, so, so we were longing for these uh, guidelines for, for almost years and years now. Uh, there are so many webinars and social media posts we must have done on abnormal bleeding. The questions came at every session. And in the hospital, we are really overburdened with the number of referrals that are coming thick and fast. A lot of bleeding, unscheduled bleeding on HRT, which is not the same as postmenopausal bleeding. That's bleeding on HRT because there has been a bit of imbalance between estrogen and progesterone. Most of the time, 99%, no endometrial pathology, normal womb lining on scan or even a hysteroscopy. So lots of unnecessary scanning, lots of unnecessary hysteroscopy, which can be very unpleasant and quite uh, invasive. And so for all those reasons, we've been asking for a uniform guideline to kind of address bleeding on HRT. And today the inbox uh, shows that. So thanks to BMS. Now, I haven't read the whole report, but I think the gist of it is that it's risk factor based approach. So rather than just saying treat this as urgent cancer referral for everybody, which is what was happening in most parts of the country right now, they're going to take an approach where they will look at the type of HRT you're on, do you have any background risk factors for womb lining pathology or cancer? And try and address a few things before you have any invasive investigations. So it will reduce the referrals, the burden, and the problems that women have to endure while going through invasive procedures to try and reduce the unnecessary referrals like postmenopausal cancer bleeding and hopefully balance out a few things. Now, we can do another one once we've had time to read through the guidelines. Hopefully we can come back and do another webinar where we just talk on the recent guidelines as well as look at unscheduled bleeding on HRT. But the, the, the principle is go for a risk factor based approach rather than a blanket two week referral. Yeah, I noticed it seemed to be saying, you know, within six weeks, it seemed to be sort of stretching those out a little bit. And it seemed to make, it seemed to give, I thought, what sounded like in, in a very, very quick read at least, 
assurance that um, if you're on X dose of estrogen, in the, in the beginning I was a little worried because it said, you know, appropriate proge progesterone for the dose of estrogen. I thought, well, that's vague. But then when I opened it up and I saw the nice little table there and I said, yes, this is what people need. That's if wonderful. you're on X dose, then it's normally, it's not a significant change. Though, I think there was one with the one where it was a bit, normally it's a, it's still the 200 generally for, for sequential HRT, 200 milligrams for 10 to 12 days, 100 for right. the, the um, but then if you're on a higher dose, they're saying perhaps pump it up to, to 300 milligrams Correct. sequential. So as we talked, the, the, high, the stronger the progestogen, more androgenic, the old synthetic progestogens were very good at stopping bleeding. But they were not good for thrombosis, breast, metabolism, heart. The younger, the newer progestogen, like the progesterone, the eutrogestan, the ditrogesterone, they are a milder forms of progestogen. So they are very good for heart and breast and thrombosis but the downside is they don't control bleeding effectively so you're seeing this increase in referrals on eutrogestan for bleeding 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 and the one way to stop bleeding for most individuals would be increase the dose so if they are on 100 if they jump to 200 daily that would stop the bleeding if they are on 200 for 12 days cyclically 312 days cyclically would stop the bleeding but again, that needs to be done by the health professional in liaison with you. Don't do it yourself. See your doctor and then they'll be able to do it gradually, progressively to make sure you stop bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody over here is having a mild heart attack and she's saying, she said it, saying this sounds a little bit scary. When she went in, her womb lining, she's basically saying it should be checked irrespective of age. When she went in, her womb lining was 27 millimeters of the cancer. And that's pretty significant. Yes. So that is why those rules have come in, is that you don't leave somebody with bleeding forever. You always have to strike a balance between not missing cancer versus over investigating and damaging somebody by doing investigations which they don't need. And that's always a sort of balancing act. So, so far we saw that actually many women were being unnecessarily subjected to lots of investigation. Sometimes they go wrong. They have problems because of investigations themselves when they don't, did not need it in the first place. But that doesn't mean you, you leave somebody on bleeding forever. So in six weeks, if something has not happened, you address it. You then get a scan. Make sure again that the scan is followed up. If certain parameters on scan don't look nice, you have to follow that up with the biopsy, hysteroscopy. So surely we're not going to leave anybody at risk of cancer uh, without investigation. But striking the right balance, this is what it is about, is that majority will not have cancer 99%. How can we reassure them by doing less invasive investigation uh, rather than just subjecting everybody to the same pathway? Yeah, yeah, yes, because they aren't pleasant. Um, they are not pleasant investigations at all. As we know. So there you go. Yes, I had an interesting chat actually this morning with a woman who's trying to, to raise awareness for, for making sure that there's proper pain control for people who do have hysteroscopies because yes. they... They can be um, they can be unpleasant. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, although not everybody finds them that bad, but they they can be. So there you go. All right. Is there anything else that we need to touch on, or do we think we've um, do we think we've vaguely covered it all? I think so. We've covered it. All right. Any other questions? Any else? Anything else that's come through the chat? No, I don't think so. I think there's a there's sort of a bit of a inter intercollegiate conversation going over there but no, no real questions so there you go good all right look thank you so much for that where do people find you should they wish to find you well i'm at uclh uh, that's my nhs hospital and we accept referrals all across the country uh, and if it's the private then it's 10 harley street menopause clinic london yeah and you take people from overseas as well at that, at that clinic as well don't you so people, right. yeah yeah, which is always good to know because I know that they find it difficult to, to find people when they're sometimes in their own countries. So, brilliant. All right, look, thank you very much. I will end this over here and and I will end it over here for you on, on um, Instagram as well. So I will see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.